I'm so sorry, ma'am. I know you need this medicine, but it looks like it's not covered by your insurance. Yeah, unfortunately, I had to deny that one. Wait, who are you? I'm your insurance company's pharmacy benefit manager. I get paid based on the price of a medicine, and I don't make as much money off this one. No one should stand between you and your medicine. Visit phrma.org slash middleman to learn more. Paid for by Pharma. Hello and welcome to GabFest Reads for the month of June. I'm Emily Bazelon, one of the hosts of Slate's Political Gab Fest. I am here today to talk about the book Animal Liberation Now with the Australian philosopher and ethicist Peter Singer. Peter, welcome. Thank you, Emily. It's good to be with you. Yeah, such a pleasure to talk with you today. Peter Singer teaches at Princeton University. In addition to the publication of this new edition of Animal Liberation Now, he is the author of another new edition of the book Ethics in the Real World, 90 Essays on Things That Matter. And we are going to be talking about Animal Liberation Now. This book is originally from 1975. It is often called the Bible of the Animal Liberation Movement. The introduction to the new edition of your book is by the philosopher Yuval Noah Harari. And he writes that animals are the main victims of history. And the treatment of domesticated animals in industrial farms is perhaps the worst crime in history. Do you think that's a defensible claim? I think it's defensible um, because of the numbers of sentient beings who we are ruthlessly using, exploiting, and causing to suffer. The the numbers are simply staggering. If if we just take vertebrate animals who we are currently raising for food, that is about 200 billion animals per year. Um, So it dwarfs the entire human population. Um, And these animals, we are really inflicting miserable lives on all of them. We are doing what Most producers, those products we want in the cheapest possible manner. Welfare doesn't come into it. Uh, It's just a matter of getting the products out there. And as I show in the uh, new version, Animal Liberation Now, there are plenty of studies actually showing that animals die in factory farms at a higher rate than they would if, for example, you gave them more space. But It doesn't matter because if you have more animals in there, you get more animals out, and that's the economic dividend, even if you're creating them so much that more of them are actually dying. So one of the points that struck me in Harari's introduction, he says that at this point, 90% of large animals on Earth are domesticated, and that they're suffering tremendously, but they're also multiplying. So what have we learned since you published Animal Liberation Now in 1975 about the suffering and the psychological needs and consciousness of animals? Because it seemed to me from reading the rest of the book that the science really made your original thesis much stronger empirically over time. The science certainly has uh, done that. It's got a lot more sophisticated, a lot more investigation of animal behavior and um, therefore a lot of deeper understanding of what we are doing to these animals in terms of their mental lives. Um, And I'd particularly like to emphasize the the science that has gone into understanding fish because of those 200 billion animals I mentioned, um, a very substantial portion are are fish reared in uh, what is called aquaculture, but that's far too nice a word for crowding thousands, hundreds of thousands of fish into into nets um, and not even giving them a, a humane death. Um, and I'm not talking here even about the number of fish who are, live swimming freely in the oceans and are then hauled up and killed, and they also have no humane slaughter. That number has been estimated to be over a trillion. So um, I think it's important that we understand animals better, that we broaden that understanding to include fish who we don't have very much empathy for because they're they're not you know soft and furry and we don't read expressions on their faces and they don't vocalize Um, and to some extent that's also true of chickens and chickens of the land vertebrate animals are the most numerous and again we understand a lot more about chickens about their behavior 
Um, and the idea that they're, you know, dumb or stupid, which I guess in the 1970s, a lot of people thought that about chickens, uh, it just isn't true. Um, you know, they know each other, they identify individuals in a flock of 50 or 60 or up to 90, but um, we crowd them into sheds with 20,000 birds in a shed. And of course, they can't recognize all of them. And that's a stressful situation for them. And what about mammals? I'm going to channel your reader who cares less about the fish and chickens, even if that's wrong, and ask about the barnyard animals in Charlotte's Web who were more trained to think about. Have we learned new things about them in the last few decades? Yes, we've also learned new things about um, uh, pigs and, and cows, certainly. For example, the breeding sows have an instinct to, to build a nest when they're about to give birth. Um, if you leave them in the natural forest habitat, they will gather leaves and twigs and things and bed down comfortably to be with their, their piglets when they're born. Um, and they will have a strong bond, as uh, mammals always do, um, particularly the females will have a strong bond to their piglets. But in, in factory farms, they're not given anything to bed with. They're just kept on, on concrete floors or metal slats because that's cheaper. You can hose away the, the manure more, more easily. Um, and uh, they're kind of trapped in a kind of iron cage um, so that they don't roll over on the piglets, which they wouldn't do if they were given space and, and room to nest. Uh, and then the piglets are just taken away from them after two or three weeks um, so that the, the sow can be made pregnant again because she's just a machine to give birth, uh, suckle the piglets for briefly, but not as long as she would naturally, um, and then do it all again. What about the environmental benefits of ceasing to produce and slaughter and eat all kinds of flesh in the way that we've been doing? At one point in your book, you say that people who care about the well-being of humans and the preservation of our climate and our environment should become vegans for those reasons alone. So why? What's at stake here? What's the impact that has just become much more apparent in our era? Well, the major impact that, of course, I didn't really know about in 1975 uh, was the contribution of the meat and dairy industry to climate change. Uh, and that's a very substantial contribution because methane is such a powerful gas in heating up the planet, um, especially if we're just looking at, say, a short period like 20 years, which many experts say is the time we have to get down to zero emissions. Methane is over 80 times as powerful as carbon dioxide uh, over a 20-year period. And, and people don't often realize that because people talk about its effect over a century, and it does break down faster than carbon dioxide. But if we only have 20 years to stop doing disastrous things to the climate, then cutting out methane is the easiest thing to do. And the way to do that is to stop eating particularly products from cows and sheep because they are the biggest producers of methane. Uh, and we don't need new technologies. We don't need new batteries. We don't need to build a new power grid. Uh, none of that. We, we just need to cut those things out of our diet. And if we all did that, we would make a big reduction in uh, greenhouse gases going into heating up the planet. But, uh, but in addition to that, a lot of people don't realize that we grow uh, a huge proportion of our crops. A large part of our agricultural land is used to grow uh, grains and soybeans to feed to animals. Um, and that includes uh, clearing the Amazon. The major cause of clearing the Amazon forest is either to graze beef cattle or to grow soybeans to feed to beef cattle and, and to chickens uh, as well. Um, and, you know, some people say to me, oh, I, I don't want to eat tofu because that's soy. And I know that the Amazon is being cleared for soy. But actually, 77% of the world's soy crop is fed to animals. So tofu and tempeh and soy milk are a very small percentage of the soy crop. And it's really inefficient to do that because the, the, the cows use at least 90% of the food value of the grains and soy we feed to them just to you know, keep them, keep their bodies alive, to keep their bodies warm, to grow bones and other organs that we don't eat. Um, so we're wasting probably 90% of the food value of those crops. And without that, we could allow much more land to revert to wildlife. Uh, we could reduce our impact on, on uh, rivers and water because Intensive farming is a major polluter of uh, inland waterways. 
Uh, and of course, there's local air pollution as well. Anybody who lives anywhere near a factory farm will tell you that when the wind blows from the farm to them, it stinks and it also produces millions of flies. So I moved you into the land of consequences and practical impacts of current human habits on people as well as animals. I want to go back to the kind of basic ethical argument you're making here, because I think that's really the main thrust of the book and its enormous contribution. And in some ways, it's kind of head spinning. You say pretty early on, many animals can feel pain. And I think we talked a little bit about why we know that even more now than we did in 1975. And then you also say there's no moral justification for treating their pain as less important than similar amounts of pain felt by humans. And I think that step is still difficult for a lot of humans, or maybe just for me. Can you talk, walk us through that a little bit and how you arrive there and what it means? I wish you were the only one that that argument was difficult for. <laughs> I'd make a lot more progress. Uh, unfortunately, it is quite widespread, so I'm glad you gave me the chance to respond to that. Um, my view is that um, the boundary line that we currently draw in terms of, of who matters morally is a boundary around our own species. If you're a member of the species Homo sapien, you matter morally, you have human rights. Um, if you don't, uh, if you're not a member of, of that species, then you don't have human rights and you don't really have any rights and you certainly don't have equal moral status or anywhere near it. Some people will say you have some moral status. We don't want to see wanton cruelty to animals, but they will accept that if there's some human benefit, we can do uh, things that cause an immense amount of suffering to animals. I think that's wrong. I think that that's a similar structure of thinking, I'm not saying that it's similar in its impact, but it's a similar structure of thinking to that of uh, racists of the most blatant kind. For example, the white European imperialists who went to Africa and captured or bought slaves, transported them in horrific conditions across to the United States or to the British colonies in the West Indies um, and sold them there uh, and, the, and, and the attitudes of the people who then held them as slaves. Uh, that was also a dominant group, a powerful group saying, we are the ones who matter. These other ones don't really matter or their interests don't matter as much as ours. We can use them as we wish. And they developed ideologies to justify that, to make them feel good, including references to the Bible, which they interpreted as saying that uh, God has said that some of the children of Shem, I think it was, are supposed to be slaves to us. We do something similar with animals. We also quote from the Bible saying God has given us dominion over the animals. And uh, for centuries, we've interpreted that dominion as saying it means we can do what we like with them. Pope Francis, to his credit, in a recent uh, encyclical, rejected that harsh interpretation of dominion and said, no, God makes us stewards of the animals. We need to look after them well. Um, that's, that's progress, but um, the previous way of thinking still has a powerful impact. And I just don't, don't see how species boundary can be a morally crucial distinction. Uh, I think that the late 18th, early 19th philosopher Jeremy Bentham got it right when he said, uh, the question is not can they reason nor can they talk, but can they suffer? And I think that is the question as to how bad it is that we inflict pain on them. It depends on whether they can suffer. And if they can, then similar amounts of suffering should be given the same weight, irrespective of the species of the being. This episode is brought to you by SAP. Welcome to the window, the window of opportunity, when your next move can either make your business famous or obsolete. So you need to be ready. Be handling good surprises and bad ones ready. Be opening a Portland, Houston, and Providence location on the same day ready. Be stock options plus paid family leave ready. SAP has been there and can help you be ready for anything that happens next, because it will. 
Be ready with SAP. This episode of the GabFest is sponsored by Wondery. From Wondery, Flipping the Bird, Elon versus Twitter is a new podcast that unravels the fascinating story of Elon Musk's unexpected bid to buy Twitter and all the drama that has happened since then. As one of the richest men on earth and a self-described business maverick, Elon epitomizes the Silicon Valley ethos of move fast and break things. And once he became Twitter's new CEO, you were either with him or against him. Those still employed at Twitter soon saw the company and its culture morphed into something they didn't recognize. He laid off 75% of the Twitter workforce, reinstated exceedingly problematic and dangerous users, and even encouraged his staff to sleep in the office. Ex-employees, Elon's critics, and fellow CEOs were quick to denounce him as an in over his head rich guy. But Twitter's doors are still open today. Is Elon all talk, or are his unruly methods actually the work of a genius? Stay tuned to the end of this episode to hear a preview of Flipping the Bird. This episode is brought to you by Caesar Gourmet Food for Dogs. Your dog deserves the best, so give them what they've always wanted, real food for dogs. Caesar Wholesome Bowls are made with real chicken or beef as the first ingredient, and fresh vegetables. Crafted with no artificial colors, flavors, or preservatives, Caesar Wholesome Bowls are great as a full meal, topper, or snack for your best friend. Pick up Caesar Wholesome Bowls in the wet dog food aisle at any major retailer near you. Caesar, love them back. Blazing deals, boundless options. It's Hot Grill Summer at Whole Foods Market from June 14th through July 4th. Fire up the grill with quality cuts at the best prices. We're talking animal welfare certified meat. Check out the sales on bone-in ribeye, beef kebabs, and New York strip steak. Round out your barbecue with plant-based proteins, sliced cheese, soft buns, and all the condiments. Plus, sales on fresh strawberries, peaches, and more. Don't forget the pie, either. Get grilling at Whole Foods Market. Terms apply. I'm so sorry, ma'am. I know you need this medicine, but it looks like it's not covered by your insurance. Yeah, unfortunately, I had to deny that one. Wait, who are you? I'm your insurance company's pharmacy benefit manager. I get paid based on the price of a medicine, and I don't make as much money off this one. No one should stand between you and your medicine. Visit phrma.org slash middleman to learn more. Paid for by Pharma. Bentham is often viewed primarily as utilitarian in his thinking, right? As the kind of godfather of that idea and philosophy. I'm going to ask a question that I think is utilitarian. Does human thriving depend on our level of being speciesists, people who put our own species above other species? You know, obviously, we wrote that line in the Bible that has been misinterpreted to allow for so much um, dominion and abuse as opposed to stewardship. Did we do that because it's necessary? I think you could argue that we did that because it was necessary at the time that that was written. For most of human evolution, and including into the historical times when uh, Genesis was written, yes, it was difficult for us to nourish ourselves adequately. And meat is a high-density nutrient, uh, so it was available to us, and no doubt that helped us to survive in, in many cases. But, but things are different today, at least for those of us, and I assume this includes most of the people who are listening now, who have the option of walking into a supermarket and buying a wide range of products, including a wide range of products that will supply their needs for protein with or without buying animal products. Uh, there are a lot of, even in 1975, there were products like like tofu and uh, other products that were high protein, uh, lentils, for example, um, basic food used in India by people who can't really afford to buy much meat and providing uh, good protein and nutrients. So, uh, you know, we could do this for a long time, but but today it's even easier because we have all these plant-based products that are available in stores that are made for people who like the taste and sort of chewy nature of, of meat in their mouth. I've got over that a long time ago, but uh, for people who want that, it's there. So I don't think that uh, we can defend the idea of using animals for human thriving anymore. Yes, it may justify things done in the past a long time ago, but certainly not in the 21st century. 
So I want to ask you about the limits of your theory. One of the things you say in the book is that to avoid speciesism does not mean that you have to hold that it's as wrong to kill a dog as it is to kill a human being in full possession of their faculties. What's happening here? How can you avoid being a speciesist without imagining equal rights, essentially, for animals? How do you make these distinctions? The statement that you quoted is based on a distinction between the wrongness of inflicting suffering and the wrongness of killing. As I said earlier, I think that the fact that a being is of a different species means that we should give equal weight to similar interests that that being has with us. So if a being can feel pain and we can estimate that it's a similar kind of pain to what we would feel under similar circumstances, then it's just as bad to inflict that pain on a non-human animal as on a human. But when it comes to killing, I think the way we think about our lives and our future does make a difference. And I do think that human beings with normal cognitive abilities have the ability to think about their lives and their future in a way that, as far as we can tell, no non-human animal has. There, there may be some that get closer to that, you know, arguably the great apes, chimpanzees and gorillas and perhaps elephants get closer to thinking about the future. There's some evidence about that. But I think other animals are living more in the present, not entirely in the present, you know, there's plenty of evidence that they do plan ahead, even to go back to chickens, um, that they can plan ahead and restrain themselves from eating something that is tasty if they have learnt that if they don't eat it now, they will get more of it later. So that's that's thinking about the future. But it's not thinking about the future in the way that we do. It's not, you know, like my students at Princeton who are studying uh, for a degree and are thinking about what will they do after they get the degree and you know people who are thinking about having a family all of those sorts of things um i don't think non-human animals think about and so they don't sort of fear death in the abstract um in the way that we do as cutting off our plans and making things that we do today pointless um, they may fear death when they're close to death or when they can smell another animal being killed i'm not saying they don't fear death at all but they don't fear death um, that might come in a in a year or two. So I think that does make it worse to kill uh, a human with those anticipations and thoughts about death than it is to kill a non-human animal. And I also think there's probably a, a greater effect on uh, family and loved ones of humans. Um, although, again, I'm not saying that there isn't an effect. There still, certainly is in many animals, including see some birds which are monogamous for life uh, and when a partner disappears or is killed they may not um, pair again so uh, i think for these reasons we can say that it's worse to kill the the human but um, that's not to say that you know it's nothing at all to kill the non-human animals the main prescription in your book i think is to become a vegan as a way of making change personally and i think also globally are there half measures that are acceptable? So I'm just going to channel um, a resistor to this prescription, like someone who says, okay, I am not going to be able to sustain or I don't want to sustain not eating any meat. That's going to be too hard for me. I know I can't do it. And so instead, I'm going to adopt some kind of middle ground half measure where I eat less meat or I don't eat some kinds of meat. Do you see that as an acceptable choice for someone who is sure in their conviction that they can't be a vegan for their whole life successfully? Or do you feel like you don't want to countenance that kind of mushiness because it's just not really meaningful? Like, do you make a good choice every time you decide not to eat steak and you eat something else? Or no, that is just the wrong way of thinking and you have to be more absolutist about it? No, I'm, I'm prepared to be a little uh, mushy here. Um, uh, there are people who call themselves reducitarians who, let's say, eat meat twice a week rather than seven days a week as they used to. Um, there are other people called conscientious omnivores who continue to eat meat but boycott factory farm products. And if they're strict in looking for 
products from animals who have reasonably good lives and are killed in a uh, the most humane way available. Um, that's also, I think, clearly a better thing to do because you know, I think factory farms in terms of animal suffering are, are the great horror. So I can accept people who really are conscientious in looking for animal products that have uh, come from animals who had good, have good lives. There, there's still the climate change problem uh, if they want to look for, say, grass-fed beef. Some people say, oh, well, I, I only will buy grass-fed beef because they haven't been in feedlots, so they're not factory farmed. They have a reasonably nice lifestyle. Unfortunately, grass-fed beef still produce a lot of methane, um, and so there is that problem about it. But if they only eat it occasionally, um, I could countenance that. I, I think we've got to try and bring as many people into this change in what we eat as possible. And I accept your point that there are going to be people who are going to say, no, going vegan is too tough. Um, so we want to suggest things that they can do and they can feel uh, sort of allied uh, with the movement uh, against animal suffering and against or to minimize climate change. So one of the nice things about republishing a book a few decades later is you can take into account hopeful developments in the interim. You talk about um, some comprehensive changes in Europe. And then in addition, a few states within the U.S. have also taken some steps that you applaud. What do you see as the most promising policy changes in the last several years? Well, if we focus on the United States, California's laws, which were brought in through uh, Proposition 12 in particular, uh, there were two referenda actually which voted on better conditions for farm animals and Proposition 12, the most recent one, is the most powerful one. And it just had a huge victory in the Supreme Court uh, when the Supreme Court said that not only does California have the power to prevent keeping uh, animals in very confined spaces, so for example that they can't even turn around or or in the case of laying hens, they can't even stretch their wings fully in the cage that they're in. It was clear that California could do that. There was no challenge to that. But the pig producers said that California could not require that all products from pigs and other animals sold in the state of California had to comply with that. They said that was contrary to the Commerce Clause in the Constitution. The Supreme Court, by a majority, said no. We're not interpreting the Commerce Clause that way. California has the right to determine how animal products are produced if they're to be sold in California. So that's a big victory. And I think it will probably force the pork producers to use Californian standards. Uh, I hope so. I hope they're not just going to have sort of one chain of slightly better kept pigs for California and, and continue the much closer confinement and restrictions that they have for the rest of the country. So I hope that other states will now follow California and do the same. I know Massachusetts already has. Uh, Massachusetts passed an initiative by 78%. I mean, you know, it's hard to find things in the United States that get 78% support in a, in a vote. So I think Americans are really on side here. That's that's the news I get from the Proposition 12 being passed. That was, I think, 64% and Massachusetts. Americans are on side here, but the political system isn't responding because of the influence of the money of the agribusiness lobby and the lobbyists that it hires. So let's get the American opinion active. Let's ask them to let their congressional representatives, both state and federal, know how they feel about factory farming and our treatment of animals. Um, and meanwhile, they can vote with their dollars, whatever state they're in, by not purchasing these factory farmed products. So I was also struck by some progress in phasing out animal experiments, particularly the cosmetic industry, and then cage-free eggs. I mean, I really welcome the idea of not having to pay super close attention in the market to what the packaging and labeling on eggs say to make sure that you're buying cage-free as opposed to like natural fed or something else that I'm not sure what it actually means. Are those also changes that you see as um, meaningful? Yes, those changes are meaningful. Um, you're right about eggs, but the labeling in the US is still not very good. Um, I'm Australian, as your listeners can hear. In Australia, when you walk into any supermarket, the big supermarket chains, you can buy three categories of eggs. There's a box that says on it clearly, eggs from caged hens. There's another box that says uh, something like barn-laid eggs. So those hens are not in cages, but they're also not outside. 
And then there's a third category, which says free range eggs. And those hens are required to have access to the outdoors, and there is a maximum stocking density for those hens as well. So that's the best category to buy. There are some eggs in the United States that I've seen which do have more descriptive content. Uh, you have to read that details, which do say the hens have access to outdoors. And in some cases, will tell you how many hens per acre. You know, you're looking for something like, let's say, not more than 500 hens per acre um, would be a reasonable stocking density. I, I wish more producers would do that and would label their eggs accordingly so that Americans could, if they are going to eat eggs at all, um, get eggs from hens who are really able to live a sort of a natural hen-like or reasonably natural hen-like life. What's it like to be the kind of founding guru or maybe a founding guru of this movement. Did you anticipate playing that role when you published this book? And what kind of impact has it had on your life? I didn't really know what to expect when I published a book in 1975. Um, on the one hand, I thought, wow, this is, you know, once people find out about factory farms and what they're doing to animals, and once they look at the ethical reasons why that's wrong, um, this is very convincing. Um, it actually convinced my editor, uh, who's Robert Silvers, the legendary editor of the New York Review of Books, and, and he went vegetarian through editing the book. So I thought if I can convince somebody like uh, Robert Silvers, surely I'm going to convince a lot of people, and this will have a big impact. Um, and yes, I will make a difference to the animal movement. Um, but I also thought, gee, you know, I'm pushing up against this huge industry, which is surely going to fight back, and it's hard to change people's eating habits. So I didn't quite know what to expect. Um, and now I'm still sort of caught in the middle because on the one hand, it didn't have that impact that in my optimistic moments, I thought maybe it will have. Maybe, you know, factory farming won't even be existing anymore in 50 years' time. And yet here it is, uh, in fact, more of it than ever, especially if we take into our view uh, what's going on in China where they're building uh, enormous factory farms now. So um, it hasn't done what I wanted, but, but there is a a strong animal movement, which didn't exist in 1975. In 1975, there were basically anti-cruelty organizations that uh, looked to protect dogs and cats and horses. And there were a couple of organizations opposed to experiments on animals, but, but there was no real animal rights movement. So that's important and that's making change. Uh, and I'm pleased about that. I feel satisfied about that. I feel disappointed. And I felt it particularly doing the research again for this book over the last couple of years, disappointed that we haven't made more progress than we have. Sometimes people say that when we look back on this moment in history and say 200 years, we're going to find factory farming of animals and eating meat to be as abhorrent and immoral as we think of enslaving people in the 19th century and earlier. Do you think that's right? Yes, I do think that's right. And I hope it won't take 200 years. I, I think people will be shocked by what we're doing to such a large number of other sentient beings. Peter, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Emily. It's been good to be with you. That's it for this month's edition of GabFest Reads. Our producer is Shana Roth. Ben Richmond is Senior Director of Operations of Podcasts. Alicia Montgomery is Vice President of Audio at Slate. We'll be back next month with another edition of GabFest Reads. And until then, all three of us, David and John and me, will be back in your feed on Thursday with a new episode of the Slate Political GabFest. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.